Hello everyone, my name is Spencer Todd Bennington. I'm from the University of South Florida in Tampa, and I'm a PhD in rhetoric and composition. And today I'll be presenting my uh, dissertation research actually. Today's presentation is called Embodying the Tao, Taekwondo Pumse as Moving Meditation. Uh, so today's presentation will discuss how martial arts like Taekwondo operate rhetorically. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about what I mean by that. Uh, I'll also provide some examples of how Taekwondo utilizes religion or spirituality as a rhetorical strategy. And then I'll offer a few potential points of intervention for further research. So first, I wanted to start by addressing what I think makes something rhetorical. So uh, rhetoric is defined by Aristotle as the faculty of observing, in any case, the available means of persuasion. Uh, first year composition teachers everywhere usually shorten this to simply the art of persuasion. But I actually like Wayne C. Booth's definition a little bit better because it sort of expands our notion out of what rhetoric could be as the entire range of resources that human beings share for producing effects on one another. And when I think of rhetoric that way, I realize very clearly that our bodies are used quite frequently to produce effects on one another, whether they be intentionally persuasive in a more traditional idea of rhetoric uh, or not. And this led me to a research avenue of embodied rhetorics. Uh, and, and a question that kind of came up as a sort of chicken and the egg thing was, which came first, the counterpunch or the counterpoint? And I asked this after reading Deborah Hawhey's 2004 work, Bodily Arts, where she really describes ancient Greek establishments like the Lyceum as both a gymnasium and a lecture hall where sophists and coach, uh, coaches and athletes were all side by side uh, doing both you know, wrestling and sort of rhetoric work. Uh, and a lot of really interesting concepts about the body and how the body operates rhetorically and, and sort of what citizens' bodies should look and act like uh, you know, came up at that time, particularly Metis Hexis, this idea of being this sort of like cunning, wily, slippery, flexible hero, uh, reminiscent of someone like Odysseus, uh, as well as Arete. Arete is the idea that the physical body reflects the virtue of the of the human being. So uh, Arete is cultural virtue and, and your physical body is, is uh, reflective of that. Um, and so Lots of these concepts took root connecting rhetoric to the body in ancient Greece. And that led me to wonder, you know, wouldn't the same thing be true for uh, perhaps ancient Chinese rhetorical traditions? Would, would they not also be embodied in uh, Asian athletic practices, specifically Asian martial arts? Uh, and so I've, I sort of decided that any martial technique can really have additional symbolic or discursive significance. And it's really dependent on sort of the timing, the delivery and, and the audience makeup. Uh, but uh, I think Bruce Lee is a good example here because his whole screen presence completely rewrites Asian bodily stereotypes in the United States from this sort of effeminate oafish character to this hardened, trained, lethal weapon. Um, and we see embodied martial rhetorics uh, of a different sort right now in contemporary discourse. All across the globe, people are discussing the kneeling restraint technique associated with the arrest and death of George Floyd. Um, some citizens are posing in this uh, kneeling restraint technique to support law enforcement. Some more violent white supremacist groups are posing this way to antagonize and, and threaten groups. Uh, and then various law enforcement officers have been kneeling in solidarity with protesters. And the point here is that this one martial technique has become rhetorical because it's something that people are using purposefully to communicate with a particular audience in an effort to produce a particular effect. Here are some of the various examples of how the kneeling restraint technique or kneeling more generally has been appropriated by different groups. And so we get to the heart of the matter when we wonder how then is Taekwondo specifically, how is this one martial art 
uh, a rhetorical institution or how does it operate rhetorically? And if we look at Taekwondo's brief history, we see that it officially formalized uh, by name in the 1950s. Uh, but then Taekwondo didn't really distinguish itself as unique from Japanese karate until the 70s. And then it underwent an entirely different transformation before it became accepted as an Olympic medal event in 2000. And now what we see of Taekwondo is almost closer to tricking uh, a lot of high flying sort of acrobatic board breaking demonstration techniques. So it's undergone multiple what I call rhetorical reinventions because the martial art has been rebranded, repurposed, and repackaged for a variety of different audiences, uh, both local, um, you know, more extended, and then eventually international. And what I looked at in my dissertation research are some of the more internal rhetorics inside the practice of Taekwondo, how they've been preserved by various institutions. These include things like national pride, patriotism, uh, Confucian values, uh, or what I looked at more specifically was Taoist cosmology and Taoist philosophy. But in this sort of first wave, this first uh, in rhetorical invention of Taekwondo, the focus was all on Korean strength, uh, national pride, uh, as evidenced by General Choi Hong Hee's sort of military-like demonstrations uh, where when he toured around his his Taekwondo demo team. And this eventually led to uh, Koreans uh, training military officers in Taekwondo uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, and so this was one vein of how Taekwondo was formed and, and continued a, a trajectory based on this narrative of patriotism. Uh, but then my research really actually focused more on this second period from 1961 to 73, what I'm calling the Koreanization of Taekwondo as a cultural art to sort of unify this new nation. Um, and this is where a lot of the Taoist cosmology comes into play. And you see a lot of concentrated effort to distance Taekwondo from uh, anything Japanese. Uh, of course, 1973 to 2000 became more associated with the globalization of Taekwondo as an international combat sport. And now Taekwondo is in an interesting place from 2000 to present as being more associated with these reunification dialogues between North and South Korea. But as I said, 61 to 73 was my particular area of focus. Uh, and this is when we started seeing a lot of the quote unquote historical archeological evidence being circulated that really invented this tradition of Taekwondo as being much more ancient than it really was. These included things like cave paintings, stone reliefs, and old tapestries. Um, we also saw the total revamp of Taekwondo and how it supported different systems of uh, Pumse. Uh, these might be better known as forms or patterns or kata in Japanese, uh, but uh, Pumse at the time, the ones that were invented by General Choi were very much centered on uh, Korean mythological heroes that were often quite patriarchal, perhaps questionable. And so one of the major things that changed was the World Taekwondo Federation uh, mandated that these new Taekwuk forms be what black belts are required to learn uh, before being recognized internationally as a black belt. Uh, and these became associated with the eight trigrams found in the ancient Chinese classic, the I Ching. If you're not familiar, these trigrams are derived from the idea of the one central Tao, the unification of all things. Uh, we can represent the Taji or the Teguk uh, as yin and yang. Uh, these can be written out as broken and unbroken lines. And as you combine yin and yang, into sets of three, we get these trigrams uh, that are correlated to the Taekwondo forms. They, they also have these sort of nature symbols associated with them and a kind of uh, philosophy behind them that, that illuminates the sort of contrasting pull of opposites in the world. Uh, and of course, most famously are the six line combinations or the hexagrams that were originally used in the I Ching for divination purposes and fortune telling. This is just kind of a brief summary 
of the eight principles associated with the eight trigrams uh, and some of their major symbols, as well as uh, brief textual descriptions from some of the manuals that I looked at. One example particularly uh, is the Jin principle symbolized by thunder. Uh, and the textual description here says that the practice of this form should help one act calmly and bravely in the, same, in the face of loud and terrifying dangers, real or imagined, knowing that they too shall pass. And so I like that this sort of illustrates the idea that this, this kind of meditative concept when put into practice can actually change this person for the better and make them more confident, more, more self-assured. And so when I conducted my research, I, I looked at these uh, seven Taekwondo manuals uh, from 1975 to 2016 and asked in which ways the principles of Pagwe were described, how they were connected to specific physical techniques, and if they were connected to social or interpersonal actions like uh, confidence that we were just looking at. Um, this is kind of a final overview of the way I coded those manuals. Uh, and the thing that I think is particularly interesting today is the lack of the uh, explicit connections to technique, um, even lower than the connections to social action. So what this says to me is that these manuals are confident in sort of recommending life advice based on the philosophy of the eight trigrams, but they never really quite figured out which specific techniques are reminiscent of what ideas. one is representative of the pure yin energy uh, and creativity and so one of the symbols that a lot of the manuals provide is this idea of uh, light or something being light and rising high to the heavens it's it's kind of strange but the way that uh, it's reflected in this form is you'll notice that most of the stances are these kind of tall walking stances until right here toward the end uh, and that's to elevate the body and, and remind it of that posture of up on high. So take a Yijang form two, uh, represented by the lake. Uh, and the explanation there is that the lake is sort of serene and calm on top, but joyous and bubbling underneath. And so this, this form is all about uh, finding that joyfulness in your practice and the thing i want to call your attention to as far as technique is right here at the very end where you go front kick front kick front kick we rarely have three kicks in a row that way and a lot of the manuals describe that as sort of being uh, a kind of joyful uh, combination to perform form three is an interesting one it means uh, fire symbolized by fire and uh, emphasizes this idea of variety you can see that right here in these combination movements uh, particularly here with the kick double punch uh, and again toward the end we'll have some three combinations as we go kick down block punch to represent that sort of flickering flame Spontaneity. Don't want to give you a play-by-play -play on all eight of these, but I will show you just this last one. Form six is interesting as it's symbolized by water and tries to teach the martial artist adaptability and flexibility. And the motion we just saw there with the roundhouse kick in the form, this is the first roundhouse kick that we do in a Taekwondo form. And it's challenging because you'll see that it requires a lot of turning posture there uh, and creates this illusion that the martial artist is moving away from that eye floor pattern, but in actuality, uh, it's just sort of a, an angular turn there. As I continued through this project, I, I became much more focused on how studying institutions and their incorporation or their use of embodied tokoi might affect more public audiences. And I, and I wanted to talk about Karate Kid as an example here because Karate Kid tells the story of two students who learn the same martial art from different teachers. One is Johnny Lawrence who learns that karate is all about striking first, striking hard, and giving no mercy. Compared to Daniel who learns from Mr. Miyagi and really doesn't even learn to throw a punch until like a week before the tournament. Instead, Daniel learns humility, self-control, restraint and ends up winning the competition because he doesn't lose his cool. 
And it's kind of a hokey sort of cliche story, but it might be fictional, but I don't think that Karate Kid isn't, you know, without some kind of a truth that's very important, especially right now. Uh, as we speak, there are groups like RAM, the Rise Above Movement, and other alt-right neo-Nazis that are training in MMA and using martial arts to disrupt protests, using martial arts as propaganda tools to recruit new members. Uh, broadening our study of martial arts institutions has us looking at police forces as well as militaries uh, and any group, especially those perpetuated by the state, that normalize the use of lethal force in certain circumstances. Ultimately, martial arts institutions craft rhetorical citizens, often in violent and dangerous ways. My future research will seek to reform martial arts institutions and to hopefully mitigate violence in our communities. I hope that scholars within my academic community can continue to foster a critical awareness of the ways that violence is used rhetorically and politically.